colleagues, welcome back to the conference. Um, we're ready to get started again. I hope that that break was helpful. Uh, it's it's very um, engaging panels and conversations, but it's always good to take a little break and then come back a bit refreshed. The next panel that we have will focus on equity in open scholarship. Um, another critical element to be in place for open science. We're looking forward to hearing from a panel of speakers representing many different backgrounds on how to ensure that all voices are heard in open science. Before we get started, I just want to update the audience that one panelist had to withdraw for, for personal reasons. Therefore, the conference program has been adapted a bit. The panel will be moderated by Mr. Nick Shockey, who is the Director of Programs and Engagement at Spark, where he focuses on fostering and supporting communities that advance open research and open education. In this capacity, Nick founded the Right to Research Coalition, an international alliance of student organizations, collectively representing students in over 100 countries around the world, that promote policies and practices that make open the default for research. In 2014, Nick led the launch of OpenCon, a conference and community that works to identify, cultivate, and empower leaders within the next generation to advance openness in research and education. To date, OpenCon has reached more than 10,000 in-person participants across 80 countries and catalyzed dozens of new projects, organizations, and campaigns. Nick collaborated with the UN Dyke Hammer School Library on an OpenCon event at the United Nations headquarters in 2018 and the first UN conference on open science in 2019. So it's great to have Nick back with us again. Nick, it's a pleasure to have you here today. The floor is yours to introduce the panelists for this session and lead the discussion. Over to you. Great, thank you so much, Astra. Uh, could you just confirm my audio is coming through? We hear you very well. Perfect. Great, so uh, as we've already explored yesterday and today, uh, we really are at a pivotal moment uh, in the COVID pandemic for climate change uh, and in the trans, uh, transition to open systems for sharing knowledge that can address both of, of these crises. Uh, the choices that we make today will have an outsized impact on what tomorrow looks like. Uh, this panel will continue that conversation with a focus on how the choices that we make now uh, will affect how equitable our systems for open research will be. Uh, as we've already started to talk about COVID vaccines uh, and the procedures to address the pandemic were developed at record pace, driven by public funding and the open dissemination of research results. Uh, and yet, now that we have these vaccines, their unequal distribution highlights the urgent inequities in global health outcomes. Similarly, as climate change continues to accelerate, the choices that we make today will determine the future for ourselves, for others, and for future generations. Uh, we heard yesterday that open research is a critical accelerator for all SDGs. And similarly, open research can be a critical accelerator for addressing climate change. But to do so and do so equitably, it must reflect uh, the diverse global community. Uh, today, the transition to open research is well underway, as we've heard, uh, but it's still very much an open question whether systems for open research will advance equity uh, or replicate existing inequities in new ways. Uh, yesterday, in her opening keynote, uh, Dr. Nair uh, Bidwell raised the risk of commercial monopol monopolization of research data, uh, a risk that Dr. Bolton echoed in his address. Uh, Dr. Medise highlighted how journal business models that rely on article processing charges uh, exclude researchers from a majority of the world's countries. Uh, and at the last meeting at the first UN Open Science Conference in uh, 2019, uh, two of the speakers, Caddy Saul and Thomas Mboa, both raised the need to address how research and education can replicate colonial systems. Uh, many others have done essential work to raise further concerns uh, about knowledge and equities, even in open systems. Scholars like Barbara Rivera Lopez have highlighted uh, just how far we have to go to make journal editorial boards representative of the global research community. Uh, Denise Albernaz has shown uh, how we can reimagine open science through a feminist lens to reach a more equitable, empathetic, and radical future. 
Uh, and there are now important projects that demonstrate what a more equitable future might look like, uh, such as Uproot, uh, publishing collective that exists to center the works, knowledge and experiences of Black, Indigenous and people of color within the context of library uh, and archive community that's reimagining the publication process to prioritize care and justice. The shift to open systems for sharing knowledge presents a unique opportunity to rebuild the foundation of these systems to be fundamentally equitable, uh, but it's an opportunity that we must pursue intentionally. Uh, as we heard yesterday, the UNESCO recommendation for open science is a powerful tool to pursue the shift to open research in a way that centers equity. And I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to moderate the session of panelists who are also already deeply engaged in this work. First, we'll have two video messages from two invited panelists who could not join us live today. Uh, Associate Professor Maui Hudson, who is director of the T. Cote Research Institute at the University of Waikato, and Dr. Stephanie Russo Carroll, uh, an assistant professor of public health and associate director for the uh, Native Nations Institute at the University of Arizona. Uh, then we will hear from each of our three panelists who will participate live in today's discussion. Uh, and I'll introduce them each briefly uh, now in the order in which they'll be speaking today. Uh, Dr. Antoinette Foster is the Director of Community Transformation at Oregon Health and Science University, where she's currently establishing a racial equity and inclusion center. Uh, she also co-founded the Alliance for Visible Diversity in Science at OHSU. Dr. Reggie Raju is Director of Research and Learning at the University of Cape Town Libraries. Uh, he's been a driving force behind Spark Africa and is also a member of the International Federation of Library Associations Academic and Research Library Standing Committee, as well as the co-convener uh, of its special interest group on library publishing. Uh, and then finally, uh, Natalia Narori is uh, has quite possibly the best title uh, of the panel. Uh, she's the data wrangler and systems manager for OA Works, uh, which you may know by its previous name, the Open Access Button. Uh, she's also currently a master's student in epidemiology at the University of Bristol, uh, where she's passionate about using open data as a tool to reduce health inequities. Uh, so as I invite the UN team to get the video messages uh, queued up and ready to play, uh, I'll just add a brief reminder uh, that we'll welcome comments and questions throughout the panel discussion using the Q&A function uh, for those that registered ahead of time and got a direct link. Uh, and also attempt to keep an eye on the Twitter hashtag uh, at hashtag Open Science UN uh, for those watching on the live stream on UN Web TV and try to integrate any comments or questions on the hashtag uh, into the discussion. And with that, I will hand it over to the UN tech team to play the two pre recorded messages. <laughs> wanting to take the chance to uh, uh, introduce ourselves at the beginning of this uh, session. Uh, my name is Maui Hudson um, and it's my colleague uh, Stephanie Carroll. We are the co-chairs of the Research Data Alliance Special Interest Group on Indigenous Data Sovereignty and been founding members of uh, the US Indigenous Data Sovereignty Network, um, Te Manararaunga, the Māori Data Sovereignty Network and the Global Indigenous Data Alliance. Um, we're really grateful that we've had the chance to provide a, a video address uh, at the UN Open Science Conference. And um, I will just move on to the slides and we'll talk from there. Kia ora. So hello everybody, Sidak Atna Kassan, Sidak Stephanie Carroll, Tishi Stas, and Dr. Alchina. Um, I'm very grateful to be here today. I'm Stephanie Carroll, I'm Atna from the native village of Kulika along the Copper River in Alaska. Um, and I wanna acknowledge the Wampanoag peoples on whose territory I sit today right now. So we'll begin by having a brief discussion about uh, indigenous peoples. And I wanna make sure that we underscore that Although there's notably not one official definition of indigenous peoples, what has evolved as a modern understanding based on cultural continuity, relationships with territory, and distinct social, economic, and political systems is that there's um, a plethora of cultures across the, the, the globe and um, uh, estimations of how many indigenous peoples there are. And so there's 
while recognition by nation states and other governments affords privileges and leverage in exercising sovereignty, it doesn't really establish sovereignty. And so today's population estimates and um, estimates of um, who is where are widely accepted as undercounts. And the important point here is that indigenous rights persevere whether they're recognized or not and whether they're written or not. Um, and so that applies to what we'll talk about um, in terms of indigenous data. Next slide. We also want to introduce um, the Global Indigenous Data Alliance um, formed in 2019. We are an international network of networks that promotes indigenous control of indigenous data, reinforcing the rights to engage in decision making in accordance with indigenous values and collective interests. Next slide. So when we talk about indigenous people's data, these include data generated by indigenous peoples, as well as by governments, private sector, and other institutions on and about indigenous peoples and their territories. So these data broadly include data, information, and knowledge in any format um, that impacts indigenous peoples as collectives and as individuals. So um, comprising information and knowledge about the environment and non-humans, which, which, which they have relations, um, information about indigenous peoples, such as census data, health data, specimens, um, and then information about indigenous peoples as collectives, including traditional and cultural information and knowledge, oral histories, ancestral and clan knowledge. Next slide. So currently the vast majority of indigenous data ranging from ethnographic material to biological materials um, to earth observations can be hard to find. They can be buried in larger collections, um, corporate data sets, university repositories, researcher possessions, and they're often mislabeled. So they do not include the indigenous peoples who are related to those data um, in the metadata um, and they're not searchable. So indigenous peoples largely are not the legal rights holders to these data. Thus these indigenous collections and data do not perpetuate indigenous provenance um, protocols for use and sharing or permissions for uh, to do such. Next slide. So in response to these issues and the increased generation and use of data in open data, big data, open science and research environments and limited opportunities for indigenous control of these data, um, there was a workshop at the Research Data Alliance Plenary at the International Data Week in 2018 to explore how to advance indigenous rights within open science um, environments. In 2019, um, Gita released the results of this workshop, which were the care principles for indigenous data governance. So they are collective benefit, authority to control, responsibility and ethics, and their sub principles, which you see here. And these principles set forth critical considerations for non-tribal data creators, stewards, and users um, to guide the inclusion of indigenous peoples in data governance and increase their access to data. So the care principles really shift the focus of data governance from consultation to values-based relationship and particip participatory uh, leadership. Next slide. As the COVID-19 pandemic evolved, um, international collaborations around data and data sharing for COVID-19 data evolved and the Research Data Alliance um, worked to produce the guidelines for data sharing. Um, so the Research Data Alliance or RDA um, really focuses on promoting data sharing um, and uh, Gita um, has collaborated with them and uh, which led to RDA really understanding the need and importance for um, indigenous recommendations within their broad um, mainstream set of recommendations for sharing, um, promoting the sharing of COVID data. And so uh, the a collaboration of RDA and GITA led to the development of a component of the guidelines focused on respecting indigenous data governance. Um, and the aim of this collaboration was to avoid increased distrust and harm that we were seeing coming about from data situations globally around COVID and to improve the quality and responsiveness of data activities for indigenous communities by setting minimum expectations for the governance and stewardship of data. Um, and we meant everything from individual um, data to community data, environment data, um, as well as socioeconomic data related to COVID. Uh, next slide. So while those guidelines really focus on uh, 
on how to promote um, data sharing within um, the, the aspects of uh, data governance. Uh, to further these guidelines, um, some of the members of the group who created those recommendations worked to develop a set of recommendations to increase in, uh, Indigenous people's access to the data for self-determined action. So moving from um, understanding we need to have a role as Indigenous peoples in the governance of the data, but also be able to use um, and, and have access to the data that are existing. So to further these um, uh, the recommendations, we put forth another set of recommendations around data, data sharing and data access. And these were to um, further invest in community capacity control data infrastructures and technology to support community capacity response and resilience. Um, the involvement of indigenous peoples, leaders, activists, and scholars in mainstream data science uh, mainstream science data policy nexus um, and the decision-making processes there. Instituting data access and sharing protocols between indigenous peoples and other governments and data holders, requiring collection and validation of indigenous identifiers or affiliation such as nation, tribe, or ethnicity within um, COVID-19 COVID data, and increasing the number of indigenous uh, data uh, workers to improve information for effective public health response. Next slide. And so if we take a, a, a little bit of a step back from the, from the COVID context and think about the principles and the care principles and how they've been put together, or actually, sorry, we should step into the, the, the COVID context and the conversations we're having now about data sharing and the value that emerges from sharing data uh, more broadly across the globe. And the principles that have been informing uh, the, the open data movement, um, open science environments, and within the, the Research Data Alliance, the FAIR principles are, are one of the primary, um, primary frameworks which gets used to promote um, uh, data sharing. And when you look at the, the principles that sit there around findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability, they were very focused on the data itself. And so it's really that how do the tech, how do the technologies, how do the technical systems interact with each other and share data across platforms? And when you look at the care principles around collective benefit, authority, control, responsibility, and ethics, you see that they're more people focused or purpose focused. And what we found in the in the research data alliance and environment is that people are seeing that these are complementary sets of principles, and that they help us. Uh, work better with data so that it creates outcomes for uh, for people and for communities. And uh, and this has started to emerge in some policy environments. So this is an example of the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. Um, they have a code of ethics for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research, which is recently being updated um, as of 2020. And in the context of an evolving, um, an evolving world and people starting to see the importance of, of data to decision making, you see in the top right hand corner around the area around Indigenous leadership, that there's a component that talks about Indigenous knowledge and data. And when you go into that section of the, uh, the guidelines, you'll see that um, they suggest that in terms of institutions with responsibility for data access and use policies, or design and management of data ecosystems, they should adopt Indigenous data sovereignty and governance principles. And researchers must be aware of and apply international data principles of fear and care. And so I think this um, recognition of the value of Indigenous principles as part of decision-making processes um, is, a, is a really important movement. Alongside that, um, the use of, or, or there's gonna be kind of particular activities and needs that need to come about so that indigenous data governance can be implemented. And one of those things is really recognizing the provenance of, or the indigenous provenance of data sets. Um, you can't govern things if you don't know what the thing is that you're governing. And so part of trying to ensure that um, indigenous people's data is findable, is con consistent with FAIR, is, is a part of that. 
And then and once you know what that is, then you can start thinking about how care applies as well. So here's an exercise which um, uh, Professor Carroll is the uh, one of the co-chairs of working with the IEEE to develop a recommended practice for the provenance of Indigenous peoples data. And so this sort of standard setting exercise is probably something that people don't traditionally think about in the context of um, Indigenous peoples data, but it's something that does drive and support um, data infrastructures. So if we're starting to think about the application um, of you know, some lessons to climate change and what can we, what can we learn about um, the COVID experience? Uh, one of the things is that when, when you have pressing situations, it's very easy to exclude small communities from decision-making processes. And um, Indigenous peoples have felt excluded in a number of environments from the sorts of decisions that have happened. So that's uh, something that, you know, really need to think about how do you maintain and involve Indigenous voices in decision-making as we think about whatever the context is, whether it's COVID-19 or whether it's climate change. Similarly, the introduction or, or the, the importance of them being there relates to the fact that these decision-making um, uh, fora are prioritizing the allocation of resources and whether indigenous communities receive resources in an equitable manner depends on their ability to participate in those, those forums. Uh, there's also uh, traditional knowledge which can add value to the decision making process and that can be brought forward to inform um, inform uh, either response activities uh, or mitigation activities and then it becomes a general concern as that information is brought into public forum about whether that is going to be subject to misappropriation around other activities. And so these sorts of general general ideas um, or general issues which Indigenous communities are, are facing need to be thought about in the context of, of data ecosystems. And just wanted to give an example here of um, some work that's been happening alongside an EU funded program, uh, the, the LICION or Local Indicators of Climate Change Impacts Observation Network which is a network of research and civil society partners supporting indigenous peoples and local communities to document and communicate local level climate change impacts. And in our engagement with um, LICI, they have uh, put together a data sovereignty statement and that just recognizes things like the care principles. And you'll see that their, um, their statement <laughs> Uh, calls for the management or around the management of data calls for indigenous recognition of indigenous ownership and knowledge and its relationship to uses, indigenous authority to control and access, prioritizing collective benefit over individual benefit, uh, recognition of context specificity, um, a values based approach which goes beyond the consultation process and consideration for future use and generations. And so Really, our take home message in this context is that, you know, if we are as a, a global network and a, and a global community promote going to promote open science, um, we need to make sure that it creates equitable outcomes. And to do that, we must be fair and care. So um, that's our, our take home message. Um, really, and from the, you know, the po point of view of the Global Indigenous Data Alliance, Indigenous control of Indigenous data is really um, allowing Indigenous to peoples to reflect and have control over their narratives. And so that that means that they're in a position to um, have control over their aspirations and their futures. So um, with that, I just want to say thank you very much. Tēnā uh, koutou katoa. Great. Well, thank you uh, so much uh, to uh, our, our two speakers. Uh, this is Professor Maui Hudson as well as Dr. Stephanie Russo-Carroll for those recorded presentations. Uh, and with that, I will go ahead and uh, turn it over to uh, Dr. Antoinette Foster from Oregon Health and Science University for our first uh, live presentation of, uh, of today's panel. First, I would just like to thank the UN organizers for putting this, uh, putting this conference together. Um, and also for inviting me as a panelist. I know that this was quite a large lift, so thank you all for your efforts. So first, I just wanted to share a little bit about who I am. 
Um, I am. Um, my name is Antoinette Foster. I am. And I'll also turn my video off to help that. Um, I'm a black Latina from the US. I am a daughter, an aunt, a friend and a partner. Uh, I have a PhD in neuroscience from Oregon Health and Science University, which is based in Portland, Oregon. And I have, along with my team, co-created a new model to address systemic racism embedded within academia that we're currently piloting at OHSU. Um, and so today, during our time, I'll use this lens to discuss my perspective on equity and climate change, which is informed by COVID, my personal experience and lessons from history. And all the opinions that I share are my own and not necessarily a reflection of the institution that I work at. And so um, instead of starting by showing you data that describes what most of us already know, perfect, thank you. Um, what most of us already know, which is that during COVID outcomes such as job loss, access to health care, who lives and who dies can largely be predicted by race, class, nationality, gender, ability, wealth, which all translates to access to power. I instead want to zoom out and talk about our process and our path, our untapped power and our potential. And I want to point out patterns that we as people have repeated and how to harness these patterns to shape the future. This is the process that our team uses to embed equity within our institution. And I believe that this process is transferable and can be applied to any situation. Um, next slide, please. So how did we get into this current moment of crisis? This is going to be a, a little annoying because there are animations in here. So can, so um, can you click please? Broadly speaking, individuals and groups made decisions driven by values of power, greed, exploitation, profit, and expansion. These values formed the basis of policies and practices that dictated whose voice, whose voice was important, how we treat each other, how we treat the land, and ultimately shaped, shaped the way that society, ultimately shaping society in a way that deprioritized the health of the earth and the life that it sustains. Many of these decisions may not seem like a big deal when we looked at them singularly at one point of time, but the collective impact of these functionally harmful values driving harmful decisions that have been repeated by different groups across time has led to our current system of inequitable power structures that lack in accountability and responsibility. This has allowed greedy corporations, power hungry politicians and nations to disproportionately create climate crisis. In addition, these are the same values that drive racial inequities. Can you click please? Racial inequities, class inequities, global inequities, and systemic oppression. Next slide. On an individual level, we are conditioned in a system of beliefs that says that power, authority, product, and money are more important than people. And we're taught the myth of scarcity and of meritocracy. And when I say we, I'm mostly referring to those who have historically and predominantly benefited from systemic racism, colonization, white supremacy, ableism, classism, patriarchy, and many other intersecting systems of oppression. But even for those who have, but even for those of us who have not predominantly benefited from these systems, we too have adopted many of the same core values and beliefs. We, especially many of us in the global north, historically and collectively used values antithetical to humanity to drive decisions and set the tone for the global culture. And our disproportionate impact on climate change demonstrates this. We shaped and practiced inequity, and in doing so, we tilled the fertile soil for climate crisis. Next slide. But now let me pause and give us a moment to breathe because this message can feel overwhelming and it can feel like all doom and gloom. But within this path, I see a promising path forward. I hope that like me, you'll see that this path that we took to get here also shows us our path to liberation and to a positive future. It shows us a path towards equitable solutions for climate change. And while we're at it, the path for equitable solutions for all of the UN sustainable development goals. Let me show you the lessons I see hidden in this path. Next slide, please. The lessons that I see are that our values shape our decisions. They are a reflection of who we are and our outcomes also reflect who we are. And next, this is key. Um, click please. Our, um, 
we choose our own values. Values like power and greed may reflect who we were, who we collectively are, and who we collectively are in this moment. But they do not have to determine who we will be. What I also see is that what we practice on a small scale is reflected on the larger scale. I see that individual and small groups decisions are reflected on a larger scale when it's repeated by many over time. People didn't all come together at once to decide on these values. They were practiced on an individual and small group level and repeated to a larger scale. Next, I also see that individuals shape the collective and that collectively we shape change. In this moment, it's climate change, but nevertheless, we shape change. Change is inevitable, but with intention, we can shape it. If we learn how we have internalized harmful values and beliefs, and once we learn how these operate within a system, we can choose to create different systems, much of what many people have already talked about today. These individual level transformations can be repeated within groups embedded into what we build and scaled over time. And this is our power to shift the culture and in turn, create new sets of norms, values, and beliefs for the next generation. This was our path to crisis, and it's also our path to equitable solutions with different values. Different values will drive different behaviors, and the values that we choose as individuals shapes our collective impact, and collectively, we shape change. Next, please. Values that drive equitable solutions are inherently relational. They center humanity and those most in need. Some of these values um, some of these values include equity itself, and equity here I mean as it relates to power, interdependence, adaptability, decentralization, with the opposite of, meaning the opposite of hierarchical power hoarding, trustworthiness, listening, resiliency, social responsibility, care, and more. The values, these values must be reflected in everything that we do and everything that we create, from emails to blueprint to code to infrastructure. We must ask, does that code and the process that it took to make that code reflect equity, decentralization, and social responsibility? When this becomes the core of who we are, our outcomes will reflect that. Okay, so easy enough, right? All we need to do is just use a different set of values to make decisions. Well, as easy as it may sound to make decisions rooted in values that help humanity, what I find from working with people is that most folks may not know how to do that. And it's the how that people become lost on, which I know may seem wild or a bit hyperbolic. However, an equitable and humanity-based value system is quite literally a different way of thinking for most people. It's a state of mind and a state of being that many are unfamiliar with. Next slide, please. To start, we must understand how much, how much of our inequitable forms of social conditioning are rooted in systems of oppression like those listed on the screen. These all have institutionalized norms, values, beliefs, behaviors, and policies that work with each other to stabilize oppression. They are innocuously embedded into everything that we do. And so even with the best intentions, without understanding how these systems operate within our society or within science or within ourselves, they will continue to show up. For example, across the scientific enterprise, we value product more than people, we value prestige and money, these values are rooted in and reflected by every system of, op of oppression that's on this list. We believe that the more prestigious an institution, the more money a scientist brings in, the more product, i.e. publications, that they are the better scientist. And we build those values into our hiring practice. With those values and those beliefs, we institutionalize all of these systems of oppression. But imagine a world where instead of valuing money and prestige, we value equity collaboration, social responsibility, and interdependence, and we build this into our selection process for hiring. How might that fundamentally change science? I believe that open science has the power to shift scientific culture, policies, and processes in this way. But in order to do this, open science advocates must also personally learn the way that we ourselves, we ourselves embody these oppressive systems which values, beliefs, practices, and policies we personally support that support oppression. If we do not understand systems of oppression on that level, we may intellectually understand why open science as a concept and practice is so important. We may want to diversify, we, want, we, we, we may want diversity, inclusion, and collaboration. We may want to build relationships, but what we will find, just as we have in the past, that, what we, that we will embed what we have not collectively unlearned into our future. One way of unlearning, next please, 
Um, one way of unlearning is to see the value and power in historically disenfranchised communities. We are conditioned to believe that historically disenfranchised communities hold less inherent value and that their knowledge, contribution, and lives are even more expendable. This is reflected by the disproportionate, this is reflected in COVID. These are the communities that are disproportionately dying due to COVID and without correction will be most affected by climate change. It is therefore critical for us to bring them into the decision-making process while we build our tools, infrastructure, and technology. We do this by building genuine relationships guided by values rooted in the benefit of others. While the onus to correct inequity should not be placed squarely on the shoulders of the oppressed, we can learn so much from communities that we push to the margins. Um, according to, um, next please, according to the United Nations Development Program's De Human Development Report in 2020, many of the world's healthiest ecosystems are managed by indigenous peoples and local community whose governance systems, values, and traditions often support biocultural diversity and promote environmental stewardship. Uh, next please. Historically disenfranchised populations like indigenous, black, brown, and poor populations have values, beliefs, and tradition, traditions and systems which are often relational, um, such as, and their values reflect that, such as independency, resiliency, and adaptability. This has been useful in our survival, and this is really baked into the core of who they are and therefore the, the core of their decision making. If we prioritize, center, value, and trust these communities, we will make equitable decisions that nurture and nurture a collective approach to climate change that prioritizes all people's lives and health. Next, please. And throughout this conference, you'll hear many concrete solutions or proposed adaptations for climate change and for open science. And while solution creators and decision makers work on these ideas, I would like to offer a questioning process to build equity into your solutions. This process determines our success as people and the survival of our planet and ultimately decides who survives and thrives, who lives and dies. Through these questions, I will refer to the concept of solutions. And here I mean anything that we build, technology, ideas, uh, tools, institutions, and relationships. Um, my, there are additional questions that I think will be published through my lessons, but I'm just going to summarize here a few questions here. and. Um, in relation to time, and I think that many of these questions can be val can be summarized by asking, are the values that we use to drive decisions based in humanity? And I, when I say drive decisions, I mean drive decisions for our solutions um, for climate change. How might we be repeating systemic oppression in our solutions? In order to understand how we repeat systemic oppression, we really have to understand the core of how it works and operates. And lastly, are we centering and empowering vulnerable communities during our solution creation process? Are we, are we trusting these communities to, um, to, to drive and really create solutions um, based on inherent values that these communities oftentimes possess? And this entire process that I've described of unlearning the embodiment of these oppressive systems, as well as identifying and addressing policies and procedures within our research programs decide, describes our entire approach at the Racial Equity and Inclusion Center that my colleagues, Dr. Letitia White, Dr. Sarah Kisawa, and I are establishing. We work closely with upper leadership, faculty, most of whom are not part of the open science movement, and also postdocs and students so that they understand how these, op how these systems function in society within science and within themselves so they too can shift towards more a more equitable future. Um, next slide, please. So I want to, to end by saying that we live by what we see. Remember that what you practice individually shapes others. Every decision that you make reflects your values and this determines your relationship with others and with the earth. Remember that we individually make up the collective and collectively we can work around resistant power structures and inequitable practices to create solutions that uplift, uplift everyone. Remember that change is inevitable and we can shape change. I've been heavily influenced by Octavia Butler, Adrian Marie Brown, and many other radical and transformative thinkers, and their ideas are all over what I've shared today. And so I want to leave you with some impactful words initially written by Octavia Butler and interpreted by Adrian Marie Brown and a bit by myself. Together, this text says that all successful life is fractal, meaning that what we see on a smart, small scale is reflected on a larger scale. It's adaptive, opportunistic, resilient, interdependent, and here I mean interdependent um, in the context of relational. 
With justly distributed power, it creates possibilities for the future, it's reflective and it learns from its past and present, and it uses all of this to shape change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Antoinette, and for bearing with us uh, through those technical difficulties. Uh, really, really appreciate it. And with that, we will go ahead and move on to our next presenter, uh, Reggie Raju from the University of Cape Town. So, uh, Reggie, if you could uh, uh, unmute and, uh, and share your presentation. I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to share the impact of climate change on the role of an academic library. I will be paying particular attention to the burning of one of the most prestigious collections on the continent and a response to this loss of Africa. The University of Cape Town is located on the slopes of the beautiful Table Mountain, green in winter and almost completely brown in summer. The growing darker shade of brown in summer is a direct result of climate change. Increased drought and longer fire seasons has seen numerous wildfires ravage the mountain. <clears throat> Scientists have indicated that South Africa faces major changes to its climate. The annual average, the, sorry, the average annual temperatures have increased by at least 1.5 times more than the observed global average of 0 0.65 degrees centigrade, centigrade in the last 50 years. This increase in temperature contributed to what is referred to as the 2015 to 2018 disaster period, where there was a drastic decline in rainfall, resulting in Cape Town's worst drought on record. The situation became so dire that Cape Town faced becoming the first major city in the world to, to run out of drinkable water. The harsh summers fuel rampant fires on the mountain. <clears throat> during, th during these fire seasons, the university was fortunate to go unaffected. <clears throat> the fires are generally fueled by high winds, dry foliage and low humidity. Fortune ran out on 18th April when the wildfires that started on the mountain had come down low enough to burn the Jagger Library of the University. The library housed rare and specialist collections such as the important African Studies collections. There are many who share the view that Africa had lost a part of its history as the slopes of the Table Mountain burnt. The issue of destruction of libraries through fire is not new in South Africa. For decades, government buildings, including libraries, have been targets of protest action as they're often viewed as bastions of the apartheid system. <clears throat> in the post-apartheid era, as indicated by Gumede, a professor at one of the leading universities in South Africa, libraries are often the first public buildings to be torched during public service delivery protests when residents express their anger violently against government corruption, lack of public services, and lack of transformation. This political or social economic aligned destruction of libraries must be must be distinguished from natural disasters be that as it may i would propose that the remedies are the same the destruction of the jagger library was the first in south africa which was cat categorized as destruction via a natural disaster <clears throat> 
the ramifications of the fire is captured by the historian and political analyst Fikeni, who said, and I quote, an African continent which has suffered several series of conquests has been struggling to reconstruct its own history and particularly that which is documented. He goes on to say that any special collection that is frail, no longer available or no longer printed very often tends to be priceless in terms of its heritage. Uh, so in terms of its heritage value and in terms of the knowledge project. <clears throat> On that faithful day of 18th April, Africa had lost a significant piece of its heritage through a natural disaster. The destruction of the Jagger Library presented UCT libraries with the opportunity to recover and rebuild for the better. The library plans to exploit the building back better strategy. The rationale for the adoption of this strategy is underpinned by the drive for a resilient recovery. <clears throat> the strategy also suggests creating opportunity in the wake of disaster. This strategy for a post-disaster recovery is widely reported to use as a response to the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. The Jagger Building Back Better strategy with regards to collections is to expand collections to promote the sharing of unique African heritage. Adopting open access principles, these digitized unique collections will be made accessible to all. Further, it also presents the university with opportunity to future proof the library's unique collections. <clears throat> South Africa's diverse and dynamic arts uh, and culture heritage is one of its richest and most important resources with, <coughs> with the capacity to generate significant economic and social benefits for the nation. Despite this richness, there is a relatively small market for books, resulting in the books being very expensive. There's a vicious cycle uh, as small print runs push up the costs of printing. The inability of the community to purchase the books limits the opportunities to bring down printing costs. The future proofing and the open sharing of unique collections become paramount in this post-disaster period. As important is the issue of preservation, improved visibility and accessibility of the rich heritage in the collections. As much as there is a desperate need to digitize analog collections, there is an even greater need to capture, digitize and share the oral heritage. The open access movement has carved a path to openly share this unique heritage. Digital technology provides the means to capture this oral heritage and the web creates the platform to share it. Africa has soared into the mobile phone era, making access to content that much easier to find access and read. And here I use the word read in its broadest sense. UCT libraries in the post-disaster period must adopt a leadership role in improving access to South African and African intellectual heritage through 
a long-term sustainable model. The potential loss of this intellectual heritage needs to be addressed through the monitoring of local and national collections and the development of an intervention similar to that of the Haiti Trust. The active participation by South African academic and research institutions in large scale digitization projects will continue to contribute to long term preservation of this unique intellectual heritage. These South African collaborative efforts must lead into a partnership between this South African equivalent to the Haiti Trust with a number of other international uh, processes. It will also support the growth of South African research as researchers will have access to millions of historical and academic texts in a repository digitized from libraries across the world. <clears throat> All recorded information from the paintings on the walls of caves and the drawings in the sand to clay tablets and videotaped speeches carries value for community, for continuity of humanity. What the disaster has brought to the fore is the vulnerability of analog collections against the continuous threat of climate change. The need is much broader than safeguarding information. The building back strategy aims to digitize heritage information and preserve that for, for posterity. In the event of disasters, including as a result of to, as a result of climate change, there is a digital version that can be converted into analog format. Accepting the criticism that the loss of rare material is, is irreplaceable. However, access is not totally lost. They, and, and this would, would ensure continuation of the existence of that heritage. Exploiting the openness processes, this heritage material can become more visible and accessible. The disaster at the University of Cape Town affirms the assertion that climate change contributes to the loss of critical and often rare information resources that carries the heritage of a society or community. The remedies proposed by libraries responds to securing the heritage of society. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reggie. Uh, Natalia, I'll go ahead and invite you to um, share your video uh, and screen for your presentation. Um, and while while that's happening, I also just want to um, especially thank Reggie for um, the time in preparing for the, this presentation and participating uh, in today's discussion. Um, you know, given the demands on his and his team's time in recovering from the the April file, fire. Um, you know, we especially appreciate uh, your contributions during such a challenging time, Reg. Hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be with you today. I was here two years ago talking about how open science was going to help solve the next pandemic, but I didn't think the next pandemic was going to happen so soon. Today, I'm going to tell you a story about what I knew then and didn't say. And that is that open does not equal fair. It's not the same as equity. I think that open science can foster equity when it helps marginalized people learn about and research topics important to them and their communities, have their research recognized and rewarded and translated into impact for their communities. Now, these are all really big and complex issues as they should be. Today, though, I'm going to try to keep things simple. Over the next 10 minutes, I'll share my experience of where open science did those things for me and where it didn't. Now, I shouldn't have to tell you that a huge number of people are traditionally excluded from taking part in research. 
I am one of those people. I am currently based in the UK, but I was born and raised in Nicaragua, a country with a long history of political repression. The situation back home has not been stable for a while, but the 2018 political crisis made matters worse. The social, economic, and political instability has forced more than 100,000 Nicaraguans to leave the country, producing one of the biggest migration crises in Latin America. My mom and dad were part of that wave of migrants. As a result, my family of five is now based in four different countries. As a Latina woman who grew up in an unstable environment, I've always had questions about what caused it. The social problems that I saw demanded answers. As Nicaragua's regiment started repressing protesters in 2018, I worried a lot about the mental health impact of forced displacement in my friends and family and turned to research to learn more about it. The thing is, the publishing system was not designed for people like me. The only way for me to get answers to my questions was through open science. Tools developed by organizations like OA Works are one of the main reasons why I was able to read about migration really early on my career. Without them, I wouldn't know about the topic as much as I do today. Now, I knew these tools because I helped build them, but not everyone can say the same about them. I was able to learn about my interests thanks to the people who had previously, previously shared their work. I might not have been able to do that otherwise. We need to do a lot more work to get this content in people's hands. Even though open science facilitated my research, I was not able to look beyond what it was allowing me. So I still found myself facing many challenges to help solve the issues that were relevant to me. Today, I'm doing an epidemiology course in the middle of COVID but COVID is not my priority. While everyone else is thinking about COVID, I'm still thinking about the problems that affect the places where me and my family have lived and have ties to for generations. Migration has huge implications for public health, but the health of migrants has been largely overlooked in research and policy. It also has very big connections to climate change. It is expected but that by the year 2050, the stock of international migrants worldwide could reach 405 million. Out of those, around 200 million are expected to be displaced by climate change. The migration crisis is one of the biggest human rights issues of our time, yet very little research is done about it. As a migrant, I want to help change that. For my master's degree dissertation, I'm using open data to look at the impact of paternal emigration on children left behind. I'm focusing on three things, mental health, nutrition, and education. For this, I'm using the Seville Longitudinal Health and Nutrition Survey, which has been following a cohort of Filipinas who gave birth between 1983 and 1984 and their offsprings. The study was originally conceptualized to understand infant feeding patterns, but thanks to its accessibility, it has been used to research other topics such as um, menstrual um, health, mental health, and also diabetes and heart disease. The SEBO website has identified 257 publications that have used their data, but a Google Scholar search finds around 681. All of this research output is there and has been possible because of the efforts of the study organizers who were pioneers in opening up health data when it was uncommon to do so. Without open data, I would not be able to conduct this study. It would be too expensive and as an early career researcher, it would be hard to get the support I need to help guide my research. Open data makes it possible for me to explore systemic problems in the communities I'm from. That said, I still had to move continents and get scholarships to learn the skills I need to know how to learn the, to know how to use the data. I am extremely fortunate to be affiliated to an institution that has the funds to help me overcome the barriers 
that would have prevented me from having my research read and recognized. I also have access to an institutional repository where I can share my work as soon as it's available. No, not many people from my background can say that. This is the article processing charge for the official journal of the Royal Society of Public Health, one of the most important journals in my field. For context, the $2,800 price tag is, is 1.3 times higher than Nicaragua's GNI per capita. The publishing system harms equity by forcing researchers without funding to choose between being seen and being rewarded. Even though there's not enough data for me to study the impact of paternal immigration on Nicaraguan children, I can get a lens on it because there's data on the Philippines. By opening up all aspects of my research, I hope to help others get answers to the questions that are important to them and their communities. There are 7.8 billion people in the world and only 1.3 billion of them speak English. 75% of scientific papers are published in English. Sin embargo, solamente un 16% de la población puede leerlos y entenderlos. English is not my first language, and the same is true for a lot of researchers out there that want to contribute and understand science, but they can't because they don't speak the lingua franca of the scientific community. By translating my work to Spanish, I can help lower the language barriers that prevent a subgroup of the population from being part of the conversation. This, combined with opening up my research methods, fosters reproducibility. In the future, I hope someone with the similar problems I face can build upon my experience working in the open, share their work openly as well, and feed the chain in ways that makes the open science the norm. So, Open science has been very, very good to the pandemic because it has enabled us to research faster. And much of it has been open, but that does not mean the research outputs have been equally distributed. I came here to say and show how we can help solve COVID and climate change fairly and equitably by designing open thoughtfully. To be able to apply lessons learned from COVID to climate change, the movement needs to work in ensuring that those who have important questions can access and produce research and transform it into real world impact for the people they care about. Today, I try to use my personal life story as a lens to prove that being open is not always the same as being equitable. But I'm not saying that open could never be fair and equitable because truth be told, I honestly think that one day it could be. Thank you so much today, Yuan, for having me. It's been an honor to come back. Thank you so much, Natalia. I will now invite uh, our other two panelists uh, to unmute and uh, uh, for the discussion portion of the panel. Give them just a moment to restart their videos and audio. Great. So, um, you know, again, I'll just uh, invite those that are watching. Um, uh, in the live stream to uh, submit questions through the Q&A function, or uh, uh, also keep an eye on Twitter if folks want to tweet questions at the hashtag uh, OpenScienceUN. Uh, while we wait on those questions, uh, I want to uh, ask a follow-up on a topic that we've touched on uh, continuously throughout uh, this, this conference so far, which is the UNESCO recommendation for open science. Uh, and I you know, as the, the first global standard setting framework uh, on open science, the recommendations really provided a powerful example of a more inclusive and consultative process for, for policy setting. Um, and given that approach, you know, it's no surprise that the recommendation highlights the central need for equity uh, throughout, and I think touches on many of the themes that, that we've heard, again, throughout the conference and on this panel in particular. Uh, and so I just wanted to kick off the discussion by inviting each of our panelists um, to share sort of their reaction to you know, sort of how uh, you think individual advocates in the wider community might be able to leverage um, this, this framework um, from such a high profile institution as UNESCO uh, to advance open science policy implementation in a way that really centers equity. Uh, and uh, Reggie, I will start. Uh, I'll invite you to respond first, uh, and then Antoinette, and then Natalia. Um, I think I, I'm not going to respond to your question. 
but I'm going to ask the question, <laughs> what is equity? I mean, we all talk about equity. What does equity mean? And I think we use the word equity to mean equality. But when society is so unequal, where does equity fit into that? The one problem that I have with the the UNESCO recommendation is that we, they use the concept of equity quite freely. But what I find lacking is the concept of social justice. Natalia talked about her experiences. And I think what she's asking for, and I think what people in the global south are asking for, is a social justice driven process. So we talk about the concept of equity, but in essence, we're talking about equality. When there is this such, when there is this such a big divide, somewhere along the line, the concept of social justice needs to drive the concept of equity. And a clear definition within the recommendations would help because what happens is that, and, and, and this is what has happened with the whole open access movement is that it meandered into the, what I call the global north ocean, the global north dominance. The, I, I think that the, 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 the commitment is there. It is not done by design, it's done by default. And as Natalia mentioned that, and, and you yourself, Nick, the whole research landscape is, and I use the word consciously, is managed by the Global North. And if we're talking about equity, how do we unbundle that? And how then we make equitable processes to ensure equity is practiced? I can give you a couple of examples of what we're pursuing in Africa in terms of how we see equity. And for me, it is again, how we driving social justice is trying to create a platform for African for Africans to publish their research. Whether it is in the indigenous language, we've just published an indigenous language textbook, or whether it is um, in, in, in English, but not the Queen's English. But as long as the science can stand up to that academic rigor. So I've given you a political response to that question because I feel that the concept of equity is used rather too loosely. Regarding with the question, I couldn't agree with what was said more, but one thing that I think that could work uh, if we start developing these frameworks is to make sure that we're equally representing, like that these policy consultations have equally consulted people from diverse backgrounds so that we can hear and make sure that the rec uh, recommendations address each of our needs. Because sometimes we have like all these policy organizations making decisions on our behalf and the consultation takes place at the very last process. And sometimes the, the, the document is already drafted and uh, it's not as easy to put equity at its core. So I think that not only consulting, but also including people from diverse communities in the writing process could, in, could make sure that what is being recommended um, would enable change. Um, that's regarding how I think the process could be better. But one thing that I've learned and, uh, is that when big organizations stand by open, they start a chain um, and encourage other organizations to follow their lead. So even though these recommendations that might not be um, as fair as we want them to be, I think that they could start a good chain uh, of events. And that's what we've seen with the Gates Foundation uh, adopting open access mandates. Now everyone, or it's ev a lot of people want to follow that lead. Um, so I think that it's important that these organizations have that in mind, but we can definitely um, do more to update and improve the processes. Something I, I think about um, is just how much, how change is created. And I think about how, um, I think that change happens from the top down and the bottom up to, 
to change the middle. And so when I think about these sets of recommendations, when I think about um, sort of the systems that are still in place that reproduce harm and that are oppressive, I think that um, similar to um, what many of the panelists have already said, I think that even if we do not have a full, fully equitable set of recommendations, I do find hope that there are at least some of the values reflected um, that can help guide us towards that space. And I also think that the power of, um, I spend a lot of time thinking about the power that that resides at what we might think of as the bottom. And I think, um, and when I say bottom, I really mean those who have less power um, within these systems. And I think about, um, and I think that the more that we can empower those who have less power, as Natalia said, those, if we can put people in positions of decision making, not think about equity as sort of a side course, but really as the main dish, I think that that is, that is how we can find equitable solutions. I think um, we really have to empower, listen, and trust those who have been at the margins um, in order to be able to find, in order to be able to find equitable solutions. Because as I mentioned in my presentation, I think um, those communities know what is best for them they know very intimately the ways that this system hasn't worked in ways that I think the majority community cannot understand and do not see. They know the blind spots that other folks can't see. And so um, we really have to be able to put them in positions of power, put them in positions of decision making and trust in what they have to say to be able to guide all of us towards equity. Thank you so much to each of you for those, uh, those responses. And uh, forgive me for having to restart teams in the, the middle there. Um, you know, as I was listening to um, your responses, you know, sort of one of the things that leapt out to me, you know, is the you know extent to which, you know, there are compromises that are made, um, you know, sort of sensibly in the name of equity, um, um, you know, to sort of make a current system, you know, sort of less inequitable, um, but don't necessarily go, you know, sort of as deep as to fully change the the system, and so. You know, one of the topics that's come up a number of t times uh, in the conversation in the conference so far, uh, you know, are around article processing charges, uh, you know, and how they replicate inequities, um, you know, and sort of the the answer of, you know, trying to make that system more equitable at the moment is sort of this charity based model where, you know, people can apply for waivers, um, you know, but then, you know, replicates, you know, sort of you know, sort of bad power structures and sort of forcing people to apply, uh, you know, for these waivers that sort of shows that the system is not designed for for them. Um, and so, uh, you know, as we're sort of in this, you know, sort of in between period where, you know, sort of open research is like our platforms for open research are beginning to be built, but aren't fully yet developed, you know, these compromises uh, you know, are emerging more and more. And so I'd be really interested in getting the panel's take on um you know on on these compromises are they acceptable as a transition mechanism or you know do they ultimately risk replicating um you know sort of existing inequities in in new ways um and natalia since you uh touched on apc specifically in your presentation uh we'll start with you uh, and then uh, go to you antoinette and then reg you can have the, the last word on that question I'm just going to break it and say that charity models don't work in any type of setting or organization because they rely on free work and that is immediately exclusive because it doesn't allow people who don't who like who need money to be part of a conversation. And I'm I'm really angry at the APC model of, of all these journals that tell you like because you're a researcher from a developing country, you get like a 50% discount, but that 50% discount is still like six months of rent for someone in. I think that's just um, it's not it, it's just a dead end model, and I think it's it can be like a marketing strategy for a journal to say that they're supporting open access, and I'm just going to break it to you this way. Since I'm in the UK, if I was home, I could apply from funding, but since I, since I moved a year ago, I can't anymore, even though my economic situation is probably the same. So 
uh, I just don't think it's fair and equitable and uh, it's just a marketing strategy in my opinion. Yeah. So something I was thinking about with this uh, waiver model, what I saw for, um, for many, um, what I saw for many journals is that you had to demonstrate your financial need. If you weren't from particular countries, um, you had to demonstrate that you uh, that you that you exhausted all available funding sources. And then you had to prove through documentation that you tried everything possible before the journal would consider um, waiving that fee. And to me, this is already inequitable. That process is already inequitable. And I'll explain why from my perspective. Um, as, as a Black Latina woman, I'm already looked at a certain way. And if I go to my institution and I ask for money to publish, when my colleagues don't have to ask for that money, what does that make me look like to my institution? Well, I look fiscally irresponsible. I look like I don't deserve to be here. Um, but the reality is, and Natalia really pointed this out in her presentation, is that, um, that we, that people from 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 these communities want to do research that's impactful for those communities, but the funding bodies don't value that research, and so and so we get less funding to even do the research in in the first place. And so what we do is we have a systemic issue that is that my that funding that I would be interested in that impacts my communities is less likely to get funded, and now I need to go and so. And so that is why I don't have as much funding. And then I have to go to my institution to uh, ask for funding, which makes me look negative. And really, that's a reflection of the system, not a personal reflection of me. And so so the idea that you even have to prove in this way um, that you've exhausted all of these resources uh, just to be able to get waivers to not have to pay these ex uh, these exorbitant prices already to me says that we have built inequity into the system and so it's not really a question of um will we will we see this replicating long term we're already seeing it replicating in that solution um and i think what makes it worse for me coming from africa africa is noted for going with the begging bowl and this is what is reinforcing the begging bowl syndrome and I'm going to give an example. I mean, I am what we call a rated researcher in South Africa. And in terms of what um, Natalia shared, the one APC for me, if you convert that into rands, it comes to around about 45,000 rands. I, as a rated researcher, get 50,000 for five years. So I can only publish one article every five years. And yet my rating is dependent on how often I publish. So for me, this APC model just creates a wider divide. And I think uh, I've been I've been seeing some of the messages that pop up about Coalition S um, and Plan S. Is, for, for us, I'm concerned. It is they are supporting a new business model. What the vendors have done is taken the ability of the authors and they've created a new business model. And I know they are now guaranteed profits rather than trying to earn their profit. Not that I'm not that I'm supporting profit. No, I'm not supporting profit. I'm saying, but this is where we're going down. And closing, just want to um uh, invite each of our three panels to share uh, a closing thought or, um, you know, also we've seen in some of the past meetings, you know, what an incredible platform um, these UN Open Science meetings are for lifting up, uh, you know, sort of projects that are advancing, uh, you know, sort of open science and particularly in an equitable way. Um, and so if there are any particular sort of people or projects, uh, you know, that the three of you sort of think of as a model um, that more people should be aware of, um, you know, would invite you to, to share those thoughts as well. Uh, uh, and I guess we can go in the, the same order with Natalia, you starting, uh, then Antoinette, and then Reggie. Okay, I'm going to say three things. Um, Tara Robertson and Denise Albernaz panel on OpenCon 2017. Uh, touching grounds on diversity and inclusion. I think that's a great um, there. It's not only inspiring, but it it's actionable as well. 
And then I really admire everything that the Mozilla Foundation is doing to increase the representation of diverse brass, uh, voices in all of their processes. And they're also doing great things to fund projects that support diversity and inclusion in the space. So um, I'll just highlight two projects that I think are really interesting and inspiring to me. One is Digital Democracy, which has a community driven research, many community driven research projects that um, adapt open, open source tools in order to help remote communities, um, uh, help com remote communities document environmental degradation and government threats. And one really cool project that they've launched very recently is the Earth De Defenders Toolkit which really helps um, communities that are disproportionately impacted by climate change share best practices and provides a way for um, folks to understand how to use the technology in a way that uh, supports local autonomy and ownership of the data. Um, and another group I just really wanna highlight is pre-review um, that I was really, uh, that, I've, that I've had the pleasure of working with and they are in, uh, part of a, Part of what they do is a platform for crowdsourcing for pre-reviews, but they've also created a program for early career researchers to learn how to construct um, equitable and socially conscious manuscript reviews. And they have really thought about how to bring the concept of systems of oppression and really expecting people to understand how that's embedded into the manuscript review process. And so that's one other project I'm very um, inspired by. Yeah, and Nick, from my side, I mean, the one project that we're working with is developing the Continental Platform. This is a platform using open source software to publish African uh, scholarly material, both journals and books. And we're pushing very hard what we call the diamond open access, where there's no cost to the, to the author nor to the reader. It is part of a service that, I'm, unfortunately, I'm speaking as a librarian. It is part of the service that a library needs to provide in this changing role of the library. Thanks, Nick. Thank you so much, Reggie, uh, Antoinette, and Natalia, as well as to uh, our two other speakers, uh, Maui and Stephanie, for their recorded presentations, uh, and to the whole team at the UN for all of their work to put on uh, this, this conference uh, these, these three days. Uh, and so uh, with that, I will pass it back to Astra to close out today's session. Thank you very much, Nick, for moderating a really excellent panel and to Mr. Hudson, Ms. Russo Carroll for their, their video intervention and to Ms. Foster, Mr. Raju and Ms. Norari for being with us today. Um, I think their remarks were really a strong reminder that open science should be a means of leaving no one behind. Um, in that respect, it would mean leaving no knowledge producer behind, but the speakers have, have clearly reminded us that this takes conscious efforts and incentives to do so, and an awareness of the origins of our values, um, and efforts to really make sure that open science is inclusive science. Um, Natalia reminded us that that's not always the case, in fact. Distinguished colleagues, this brings us to the close of day two of the conference. Um, at least from my vantage point, the dialogue today was, was really incredibly inspiring. We had Professor Bolton open the, the conference with a, a comprehensive assessment of how the interface between science and society has evolved through history, the current context of open science, and, and within that, the nature of the challenges we face from COVID-19 to climate change. Um, these are really the issues, increasing poverty, increasing hunger, that we need to be able to apply science to solve. Dr. Bolton made it clear that the preservation and resilience of humanity require science for solutions. We really can't do this without science. But these challenges are also uh, cross-cutting and they call for global cooperation because the challenges do not see borders, even though some of our institutions do. He also reminded us of the opportunity, opportunities we have for greater collaboration uh, with digital technologies and with uh, global efforts to solve some of the um, looming problems that we face and global efforts to establish open science principles we've heard about what UNESCO is doing um, multiple times in, in, the, in the past two days. And it's, it's hopeful that we can um, develop some principles that can guide more progress toward open science. We then had two panels that dove deep into how open science is evolving in different contexts. 
and how to bring about better collaboration among different stakeholders, and also the importance of addressing issues of trust, of data sharing, data governance, and privacy rights. We heard about efforts to integrate principles um, in open science, including recognizing the data of indigenous peoples and structuring inclusive approaches to open science that address inequities and in power structures and also embrace social justice. There's, there's a um, very strong theme running through today that science is embedded in social, political, and economic structures that may or may not push us toward a more inclusive and open way of doing science or push us to apply science to some of the pressing issues that really um, have implications for our long-term resilience or for the well-being um, of all people, not just of some people. So on behalf of the Dag Hammarskjöld Library and you and Dessa, I would like to extend a warm thank you to all the speakers and the audience. Um, you've had very active engagement, insightful questions and really action oriented remarks. And this um, reflects the commitment that is felt toward advancing open science and all the resources we have at hand to do so. We hope to see you back tomorrow at 8 a.m. New York time for the final day of the conference. Tomorrow we'll open with keynote remarks from Dr. Jean-Claude Guidon, the professor of comparative literature at the University of Montreal. During the session tomorrow, open science infrastructures will be assessed and there will be opportunities for early career leaders to engage with established leaders and policymakers in open science um, to help advance the 2030 agenda at the UN. Until then, wishing you rest and reflection on all of the really interesting um, discussions that have happened today, and we will see you back tomorrow. Thank you so much. <laughs>